and welcome everybody to the design mechanism uh, seminar for Gen Con 2020. Uh, we've got about 30 people here, which is absolutely fantastic. This is, I think, the best attended design mechanism panel at Gen Con we've ever had. We, we had a couple of people uh, a few years ago, the last time we were there in person. So obviously online is the way to go from now on. And uh, those of you that are uh, sort of signing up for Gen Con things, I hope you've had a, a great convention so far. I've uh, run a couple of scenarios over the past couple of days. I've got one tomorrow and it's been, it's been great fun. It's worked sort of really, really well. Um, so welcome to, to everybody. Um, I've got various people who sort of Plodding into the waiting room. Um, one of my my group from uh, here in, in Grafton is just joining. Welcome to Eric when he, he sort of gets on. And um, I, I've, I've sort of got a very loose agenda for, for what I want to, to sort of talk about here. I'm going to start off with some introductions to the design mechanism team because I think we have just about everybody that works regularly with, with Pete and I. Um, so I'll introduce them to you um, in, in a moment or so. Um, we I, I want to talk about you know what sort of year TDM has had, the things that we've produced, um, what we're looking forward to for the remainder of the year, and then sort of look ahead for, for some releases for next year and beyond. Um, talk a little bit about um, some of the, the uh, gateway publishers that are starting to produce things with Metras, and, uh, and then to talk about some of the other products like Casting the Runes and, uh, and Leoness. Um, you, lots of you submitted some really good challenging questions uh, by the message board, which I've taken a note of. We're not going to have time to get through all of them, I'm afraid, but uh, we will get through absolutely as, as many as we can. And I'm going to invite the, the different members of the, members of the TDM panel to help with those answers or answer some of those. Um, there are some questions that uh, actually I'm really not the best person to do the answering for. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce the, the, uh, the TDM panel. And this is actually as they appear on my screen. Uh, so we have Brian Pivik. Uh, Brian is our managing editor, and he's responsible for, for all sorts of editorial stuff that we, we do in, uh, in design mechanism. So, uh, Brian, anything you'd like to say in your defense? Um, no, it's, uh, it's been a great time working with Laws and Pete uh, over the years. I've, I've had the opportunity to look at a wide variety of content that we've produced. And uh, no, it's, it's just been a... It's been a good ride, and I'm, I'm looking forward to many more years of editorial. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. And uh, after that, we have another member of the editorial team, which is Carol Johnson. And, and, and Carol has done lots of editing um, on a whole range of books um, over the years. With us. Uh, so, Carol, uh, say hi and anything you want to say. Um, hello. I also have been working with uh, you all for quite some time now yeah. and very much enjoy helping people to bring their ideas to fruition, um, to do the best possible product out there. And there are amazing things out there. So it's been a joy working with you and I hope to work with more of you. So. Um, you absolutely will. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Mr. Peter Nash. Well, uh... <laughs> Being the silent partner of the business, I'm going to remain mostly silent. It's very late here and I'm kind of half asleep already. So uh, I'll let Lars do the talking because he's much better at it than me. Right, we want lots of questions about Mythic Greece now. No. <laughs> the gloves, gloves are off. Um, next across, we have a special guest with us. And um, uh, this is Mike Larrymore. And Mike, I invited specifically along because he is... Uh, the main author behind one of the projects that we've got coming up. And there's actually a question about it that's been posted to the forum. So, Mike, don't say too much, but uh, do say hello to everybody. Uh, hello, I'm Mike Larimore. I'm a relative new addition to Design Mechanism, and I appreciate the opportunity of, the opportunity to be here tonight. Thanks, Lars. You're welcome. Uh, next up that's appearing on my screen is Ian Inwills Wilson. And Ian produces the fabulous... Mithras Matters podcast for us and he did so many videos now of, of live plays and, and rules examinations I've completely lost count so Ian please say hello hello everyone yeah it's late here as well so I, I, I just finished like everybody else GMing for the night so my eyes are popped open at the moment but it's lovely to be here very much so 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person that's popping up here for me is Mr. Rodney Leary, our classic fantasy uh, line manager. Rod, over to you. Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, it's great to actually be able to see a lot of you guys. I haven't, haven't met a lot of you officially before. Uh, as he said, I'm the classic fantasy line manager, and uh, I oversee the production of all of the adventures and uh, supplements and uh, uh, currently working on the Unearthed Companion. Wonderful. Thank you, Rod. And last but by no means least, we've got the latest addition to the team. Um, but for, for many, many years, the art direction has kind of floated around. Uh, the various people often meet, um, which is not necessarily a good thing. But uh, we now have a dedicated art director. And this is the incredibly wonderful Sophia Connor. Uh, Sophia, welcome officially to the TDM team. Um, and over to you to say a few words. Well, I've joined the... Uh joined the, the team fairly, fairly recently, but I have been working with TDM for about 18 months on a major horror release, which is, I'm sure we'll be talked about later. Um, my job is to commission the artists, chivy the artists, chase the artists, tell the artists off, um, make sure they do their work on time, <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, design the, gem the general uh, look of, uh, the, of the imagery that you appeared in TDM books. I'm doing a fantastic job as well. Uh, so, so busy working on Mythic Babylon and wrangling artists, which we've, oh, we've yes. done a fair amount of over the past 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, more of that later. Yeah. So I, I think that that is, is everybody that we've got on the TDM team. So, so thanks everyone for, for staying up late and, um, and joining us. And what I wanted to sort of kick off with was a little bit about the kind of year that we've had and uh, what we can look forward to over 2020. Um, We've not had that many releases out over the year, but what we have had have been big ones. Um, the, the main product that we released was Leon S that came out on the on the 1st of May. Uh, been incredibly well received. Um, uh, it, it, it spent, I think, three weeks um, in the top 10 on drive through RPG, and at least a week and a half of that was at number one which uh, was, was a huge reward for all the hard work that, that went into such a, a, a such a big and, and complicated book. Um, it, it, it was a labor of love for everybody that was involved with it. Um, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of, um, of effort and time spent, but it's one of the more satisfying projects that we've worked on in the way that it came together. Uh, it needed surprisingly little mechanical editing to, to bring stuff into the format that you see. It's uh, one of those books where the quality of the writing really, really shows through. And it, it does the subject matter such justice that um, John Vance has sent not one but two um, dedicated words of praise about how his, his, his father, Jack Vance, uh, would have loved to have seen this in print. And that to us is the, the highest highest um, accolade that we could we could wish for. Um, so Leoness has kind of taken up most of our time in getting it ready for publication this year. Um, but there's been a couple of other things that we released too. Uh, we released um, another in the uh, the combat modules series, which are designed to sort of help people get to grips with the nuances of Mithras combat. And that was called Take Cover. Also incredibly well received. We've got another one that's uh, on its way that um, the writer, Dan True, has just sent through to us. So there's going to be more coming up for that. Um, we also released uh, Miros Doomed, which is a campaign that Pete first produced for Phoenix magazine in Sweden and was released over a series of different issues. And we have sort of been sitting on this for a while and I, I found it in, uh, in, in my hard drive and thought, you know, we really should get something done with this. And I was just wrapping up what was happening with Leoness wanted to carry on and get something out there. So uh, we put Miros Doom together in a, a brand new format and have, have released that for those people that like to follow the exploits of Anathame and Kara and, uh, and all her friends. So uh, that was a nice thing to, to release. And aside from that, the other thing that's taken up a fair amount of time has been casting the runes, which is not a Mithras game. It's based on Gumshoe, but it is based on um, an author that, that myself, Pete, so, and uh, uh, the writer, um, uh, Paul St. John McIntosh, uh, hold in, in huge esteem, and that's um, Montague Rhodes James, MR James, who who really developed the format for the quintessential 
British ghost story, you know, the, the kind of ghost story that, that's been made famous from the Edwardian period all the way up and is still enjoyed by millions of people today. And the gumshoe is a, sorry, it, Casting of the Runes is a fantastic evocation of M.R. James's work, the Edwardian period, and the, the sort of seminal ghost and supernatural writing that was coming out of that time. So it's not just about M.R. James, it's about Arthur Macken, it's about Lytton Strachey, um, it's about Algernon Blackwood, all these seminal writers that were influential on people like H.P. Lovecraft, Robert Block, Ramsey Campbell. And Ramsey Campbell actually contributed the forward to uh, to the game. Uh, we, we, were, we were thrilled that uh, he wanted to contribute to it. So we kick-started that one at the start of the year. That's taken up quite a lot of time. I'm sending the print proofs off to the printer, hopefully tomorrow. So we're kind of on track, despite COVID and so forth. Um, and that will be on its way to back as I'm hoping around September, October time. Um, so that as well has, has taken up a fair amount of energy. Um, other things that we can look forward to throughout the, the rest of the year. Um, there's one release that we've we've been doing a lot of work on and Sophia has done a huge amount of work on it, both the layout for it and the art direction for it. Carol worked on this one as well as the, the chief editor. And that is Fiora Cheetah which is written by Alex Green. And it's a, um, a fantasy city-state based very much on the, the Renaissance Italian city-states of Florence and Milan of the time of the, uh, the Medici's and uh, the Borgias and all that sort of good stuff. Um, it's complete. We are just finalizing the index and some of the cross-referencing. And I'm hoping that we will have that out and in print uh probably september october time so it's it's all done it's all finished and uh hopefully a little later on i'll, I'll share some sort of uh, screenshots of uh, the layout for that so you can see what it looks like inside um so that's kind of what we're, we're going to be doing for for the rest of the year fiora cheetah will be um our our next release that uh that, that comes out um there's obviously work going on on other things. We've uh, we've got the project that uh, Brian and Mike Larrymore are heavily involved with at the moment. That's currently going through editorial, and I'll, I'll let them talk about that. Um, we also have uh, Mythic Babylon now well into production, which has been a long way to text. We've uh, we started the layout with some of that. The art direction has begun. Uh, as uh, Sophie and I were saying, we, we, we've sort of been wrangling artists over, over the past week, but uh, we, we've got some, some really good contributors to that book and we're looking forward to, to that coming out. That won't be out this year. Uh, there's just so much work that goes on there. There's no way the artwork will be completed by the end of 2020. So it's going to be a major release for 2021, but it's going to be a big book. It's going to be, uh, I think, visually impressive. And the amount of detail that's gone into the research of it is phenomenal. Um, Chris Gilmore and Paul Michener. Uh, Paul has worked with us before on a couple of projects. Uh, Chris is a first time writer, but he's got such a love and detailed knowledge of Mesopotamia, the Babylonian period, um, um, Akkad and, and all that era. It really comes through in the quality of the writing and even in the art direction, which is some of the most complex and challenging that we've had to deal with, but it's all gonna be well worth the wait. Um, so that's kind of on the standard Mithras and our mythic side. There's a couple of other projects that we're, we're uh, sort of tidying up. We've just finished editorial work on Mythic Polynesia, which is, it, it, I think, will blow people's socks off. Wouldn't you agree, Brian? He's on mute. There we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, that one was a pleasure to uh, to edit. And it was it, it was exciting because that's that's an area that, doesn't really get a lot of attention in RPGs, Absolutely. so yeah, I'm excited to see that one come out. Um, Mythic Polynesia is a it's a Mark Shirley opus. Um, those of you that have been sort of following what we've been doing will know that Mark wrote Mythic Constantinople for us. He wrote the Waterlands scenario for Mythic Britain. Did a fantastic job on that. He's doing some more Mythic Britain for us. Um, he was a major contributor to to Leoness and Mythic Polynesia follows in that wonderful writing style that he has and his ability to convey immense amounts of atmosphere and factual historical detail very concisely and very readably and that's a real a real strength of his and it's a real talent it's a it's a joy to work with with his manuscripts whenever we get something from mark where we're always pretty excited um 
other things that are going on. I'm actually going to pause and, and uh, open a can of beer and replenish my 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 official uh, Minlister glass here. And I'm going to let Rod talk a little bit. Sorry to drop you in it, Rod. But Rod, t- talk to us a bit more about what's going on on the classic fantasy side, because people always want to know about what we're doing on CF and what's in the pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of things in the pipeline. Uh, as I said, I'm uh, in the process of finishing up uh, Unearth- the Unearth Companion. Uh, that'll be followed by uh, the World of Greymoor, which will be getting its own separate book. Uh, that'd probably be toward the, the end of next year, being realistic. Uh, as far as adventures, there's a ton of them in the pipeline. Uh, I'm going to throw some titles at you relatively quick, but uh, The Lost Temple of Set will be the first one coming out. Trouble and Nevermind, The Danger at Dunfell. Last Gift from Atlan, The Star Prophecy, Sky Tower, and The War on Twilight Peak are all adventures that have been turned into me that are all in various stages of development. Um, and then I have a bunch of things planned for after the world of Greymoor comes out, typically smaller supplements, uh, one dealing with witchcraft and alchemy, one with psionics and psionicists, as well as psionic monsters, and lastly, one dealing with chaos, uh, which is good. And each one will include a brand new character class pertaining to it. Uh, the chaos one will add the witch hunter class, for instance. So that's some of the things that's planned for classic fantasy over the next probably three years being realistic. Thank you very much, Rob. Are, are we releasing Nevermind twice? Oh, skip that. <laughs> Nevermind's out. <laughs> Outdated paperwork. Never mind, not a problem. <laughs> So that, that's there's, there's a heck of a lot that we've got in the pipeline. We've, as, as, as Rod says, we've actually got more than enough stuff to keep us going, I think, very comfortably for, for the next three years or so. So uh, lots and lots to, to look forward to. And something that we, we, we always seem to be quite good at is producing unexpected projects that sort of drop into our lap. Uh, from time to time you know we have the big things that we're working on like babylon and polynesia and runes and leoness and so forth but little things crop up you know someone comes to us with an idea or a fully formed concept and uh, we find that we've got the time we can slot it in produce it quite quickly release it and uh, we've been pretty successful in doing that um you know the, the miros thing that we just released that, that pete had um so a lot of stuff that, that's kind of going on, certainly a lot on the mythics range. Um, one of the questions that I think uh, that, that Mike Vile Traveller um, asked about was what's happening with Luther Arkwright? So we do have some news on that. And the, the good news is that we have renewed our contracts with uh, uh, Brian Talbot for a further seven years. So we will carry on producing material for Arkwright. Um, those of you that, that follow Brian Talbot's work and the Luther Arkwright saga as well may know that he's currently working on a brand new Luther Arkwright graphic novel. He's just completed the pencils on it. I had an email from him last week confirming that all that is done, stories finished, pencils finished. He's going to start on the inking and the coloring very soon. It'll take a couple of years for this to come out. And uh, once we know what sort of shape that is going to be taking, Brian will be sending us some advanced information on the story, and we will more than likely take the opportunity to re-release Luther Arkwright as a standalone game. Mike, are you happy now? Um, And incorporate all the new information that's going to come out. So although we haven't done too much with with Arkwright at the moment, um, we do have some plans for some adventures that have been part of Pete's house campaign that uh, I've played in when I've I've been over for the annual PeteCon extravaganza in uh, February each year. And uh, we're looking at how we can release those. And we will fully update the uh, the Arkwright game too to take into account the new graphic novel. So that's way off. You know, it's a good couple of years in the future, but uh, it's good news that uh, we can keep supporting Luther Arkwright. It's, uh, it, although it's not one of our biggest sellers, it's one that we're so fond of where we don't want to let it go. So we will keep supporting it, even if it's only in small ways. And uh, we will re-release the game as a, a full standalone product to hopefully coincide, coincide with the release of the new Luther Arkwright graphic novel when that comes out. Okay, so that, that's kind of what we've been doing on the, uh, <clears throat> the publication side and all that sort of stuff. Um, one person that's been incredibly busy every month uh, producing podcasts and live play videos and his rules examinations is is Ian Wilson um, in Wills to, to, to the people that uh, 
that sort of know him quite well. And yeah, I want to give a big shout out to to the efforts that that Ian has put in every month, uh, unfailingly and unstintingly, to producing the podcast because it's not easy coming up with the content. It's not easy coming up with people to speak to, uh, lining up the interviews and that kind of thing. And the fact that we're now at is it episode fourteen, Ian? I think you're still on mute. Yeah, 15, episode 15 came out today. 15, that's 15 uh, months worth. Yeah. You mean you haven't listened to it yet? I've not had a chance, no, but I've been gaming since uh, since about 11 o'clock this morning, but I will. And it, it's, it's the podcast itself has a 4,864 downloads for total throughout, because it's been going roughly for just over a year now, so... That's really fantastic. Really good news as well. And thank you to everybody who comes on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> and it's been lovely interviewing you and having chats with you as well. And, you know, we, we really do welcome people coming to us with ideas for the podcast. I think go directly to, to, to Ian or, or come through myself or Brian or any of the team that's on here and uh, let us know if there's anything that you'd like to see or if you think you've got something you can contribute. Maybe you've had a really memorable campaign that you want to talk about, you know, a Mithras campaign that, that really meant something to you. Anything like that, anything to help broaden the content and, you know, really help make Mithras matter, which is, you know, the, the theme of the of the podcast itself. So it, it's great work. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to have another 15 episodes over the, uh, the the course of the next 15 months. And you're doing a fantastic job, Ian. Please keep up the great work. And anybody that hasn't listened to the podcast, rush out and, and go and listen to it. Um, we will be putting a dedicated part of the TDM forum um, aside just for podcasts, because it's not just Ian that's now producing one. Um, Bill Harger and Raleel are, are, are two of our, our, our sort of fans and supporters. They have their own podcast that they've launched as well. Uh, so, Bill, I, I don't know if you want to talk a, a little bit about what you and Raleel are doing there. If you do, the floor is yours. Uh, um, I don't know. Um, Doug, if you want to say something, you'll be you'll better. <laughs> Uh, uh talking we got we've got a, th a few ideas um i think coming up we might do something um uh what do we do my mind's got actually gone blank doug do you want well, to I'll put you on part, the we got part two of animism coming up right and and then uh then we have we have uh the the one that you just that you just sent me was with uh Dan True, is that oh, correct? Oh, yeah, so we might be doing something with Dan. So the idea is do something about combat and also do something about uh, what Dan is working on, which I don't know if... I know he's talked to you, uh, Loz, but I don't think anyone else knows about that stuff. We might have a, a word with him about what he's doing. Oh, That's Carol knows about it because she's edited it. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's it's no secret that um, Dan True has... has, has produced a supplement, uh, which again is one of these fantasy city ideas that we, we sort of been uh, messing around with, very much like Fiora Cheetah. This is based on the, the Hanseatic leak states of the, uh, the sort of the, the, the late Renaissance, uh, 17th, 16th, 17th century period. And it's called Gweldum. Uh, it's got a very, very different atmosphere to it than, uh, than many of our other books. So it's not one of our mythics range. Um, it is very much designed to sort of fill this niche for a, a city inspired by real historical events with a fantasy kind of spin on it. Um, and really, it's been trying to find somewhere in the production pipeline to be able to, to, to put it in. But now we've been talking about it, we, it, it kind of commits us to making sure we do something with it. So all the work that, uh, that Carol has put into uh, to helping get Gweldon together, and you know all the work obviously that Dan has put into it, um, it, it will come to fruition. And I think we'll probably see that coming out probably slyly slotted into the production schedule somewhere during 2021. Can I just have a brief interjection and uh, say thank you to you two for your in-depth analysis of Monster Island, because um, you two were really starting to dig into the various layers and depths that I wrote into that supplement. And it was fascinating to see what you discovered and what you didn't discover. So um, it was lovely to, to, for people to, for me to hear people taking it as serious 
piece of work rather than just yet another sword and sorcery bog standard setting. So thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. We uh, we we enjoyed that one a lot. I think we uh, we do we do the podcast, and frankly, sometimes I, I think it's uh, we just like getting on and talking about Mithras for an hour once a month. Uh, and sometimes it's not an hour, it's more like two. So we, we really do enjoy it. And thank you very much for writing it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think, Doug, I can't remember your phrase that you use, but it's, it's something that you can keep going back to and it still reveals itself. Um, every time you go back, there's something, there's something there. So yeah, Monster yeah. Island is, is certainly a big favorite of, of both of us, I think. It's a lifetime's worth of campaign in a single book. And it's been showing that for us so over and over again. So, was, was uh, why, some... why we talked about the tenth anniversary edition, which is yeah. <laughs> just that's a couple of years fun. away. <laughs> yeah, well, there is supplemental we material. Back. There is supplemental yeah. material. Will there be a tenth anniversary edition? I, I, I don't know. What we will be doing is sort of revamping it so we can put it into um, print-on-demand format, so we can host it on drive-through. The, uh, you know, the core sales of the book. It, it doesn't warrant doing another offset print run of it, but it's a good size for print-on-demand. So we will revamp the layout. Um, you know, if there's any any um, odd bits of things that we can sort of add in there to sort of boost up the content, uh, we will look at doing that as well. But to to sort of satisfy Hanu's curiosity, there is some more Monster Island coming out. Um, it's not written by Pete, it's not written by me, but it is written by um, John Holmes, who's Antelon here on this this uh, um, this Zoom meeting, and Brian has just finished editing the manuscript. So, John, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about uh, Bird in the Hand. Uh, good, whatever time it is in your respective zones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wake up, John. Just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll just try, I'll just try. Um, thank you, Loz, and Brian, to see you uh, in the flesh, almost. Um, so, uh, Bird in the Hand um, is... Hopefully, and I said, oh, it's quite a hopefully quite a long and challenging adventure. Certainly, I found my players certainly went off in a number of directions I hadn't anticipated. Um, I think Loz and Brian did mention a few times it appears to be a little bit um, dangerous, perhaps deadly now and then. But you know, it's, it's Monster, Monster Island. Island. Yeah, it's Monster Island. It's got a high body count to it. <laughs> yeah, and that seems only reasonable. I felt so. Uh, um, I'll see. I, I, I think I'll, I'll wait until it, it, it goes through and comes out, and I'm hoping it will be something worthy of of what Monster Island is, which is just a just a brilliantly deep and lovely campaign setting. And I, the one to regret, perhaps I did not put in the proper Harry House and skeletons, so that will be the job for the next the next one because that that is the way skeletons should be, after all. Uh, oh, absolutely. Nobody, <laughs> nobody can nobody can be. Uh, Harry Housen, when it comes to anything fantasy yeah. monster yeah. Uh, related, he, he's still a massive influence in everything that we do. Jordan Shield, so, 80% and swim zero. Yes. And uh, thank you for the opportunity, actually. My, you know, my principal objective was was just to give some more love back to Monster Island because it's, you know, it, it, uh, it's worthy. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, it's it, it's going to. I'm really looking forward to, to bringing it out. So uh, yeah, I, I know again, it's been one of those things. It's been a bit of a slog, uh, but we got there. And uh, thanks for sticking with us. Um, so what I thought I'd do uh, for a couple of minutes, I'm, I'm just going to share my screen, and I, I'm just going to show you a, a little bit of uh, a couple of things that we're we're working on at the moment. Um, I thought I'd share with you the template for the the Mythic Babylon layout that we've we've been playing with. I know Sophie will want to see this. Uh, since she's managing the art for it. Um, I didn't get my act together, so and I didn't download any of James's artwork to, to share. So maybe I'll sort of do that afterwards and uh, and send out a link to people that participated in the meeting. Um, so let me just share my screen and uh, give you a, a quick look at um, what, uh, what we're working on for it. So do let me know when you can see this. Yeah, we can see that. And it's come through, has it? Yep. Yep. 
Okay, so this is this is kind of the, how we approach doing the layout for a book, or how I approach doing a layout for it. Um, I I like to get some of the the proper text in there to work with, uh, sort of mess around with the graphic design elements. All the design elements you can see on here are largely placeholders. It's likely that uh, Soph will be commissioning some bespoke art to fill in um, some of like these 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 footer banners down here and. Uh, the, the little sphinx uh, of the uh, the bid bull um, data that we have up there, but the the text that you can see on here this is uh, this is the actual text of the book, and so we're playing around with the fonts and uh, what the layout is going to be, and typically follows our normal sort of mythic style in that we like to keep it two column, nice and clean. Um, with some sort of good called out box text. So work on Mythic Babylon is progressing nicely. You know, we're looking at how the layout will, will be, how the layout will feel. And the some of the artwork has come in, both preliminaries and some of the finals. Uh, Soph, do you want to, to, to say anything about the, the artwork, both for Babylon and for Fiora Cheetah? Um, yeah, the, for Babylon, we've... Uh, we've, we've trying to give it a real a real feel of the uh of the style of the of the of the, of the, the way um the way the cities of the, that period actually appeared and their their dress and um artifacts and so forth like that so uh, the, it won't look like um like a standard fancy art shall we say I mean, also there's loads of uh, amazing bestiary of um of the monsters of their incredibly rich and horribly nasty um, mytho mythology, you know, plague demons and goat-headed watsits that come and get you in your sleep, and um, um, there's all kinds of nasties. And and we're we're developing the developing a, a very um, very trying to make them look look different, shall we say? And um, we've got we our work the. There's going to be one artist who's doing most of the work. He's um, new for us, but he's done a lot of, of that kind of thing before. Um, he's developed a, a quite a unique um, evocation of the of the um, of, of the uh, of the period, which I think people are going to enjoy. You know, this isn't uh, we we're not. This is you know not just not a dry um, dry version of you know, of it, but like. With the amps turned up to 11 shall we say <laughs> and threaded kind of throughout the whole of mythic babylon are, are hammer ruby's laws which are real if you know the period there there are real Three. edicts that, that yeah, sort yeah. of uh, were, were created by hammer ruby one of the first kings of uh, of um, the, the akkadian empire and uh, yeah. he sort of laid down how the city and the state were meant to work together, mm. how people conducted themselves, how law would work. And, and it really was sort of the birth of uh, um, the template for a constitution. And we've, we've got these threaded throughout Mythic Babylon, um, illustrating different parts of uh, the backgrounds of society, the laws and, and so forth. And of course, th there's actually laws on how you deal with sorcerers and demon worship and all that kind of thing in there. So it's an absolute gift. Wow. For, uh, considering, for considering how nasty the demons and the sorcerers are, that seems very reasonable you'd want to clamp down on them. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to flick over here to Fiora Cheetah, which is uh, the one that we were just talking about that uh, mm -hmm. Soph has, has sort of been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're sort of indexing this book. Um, the artwork's a bit pixelated because these are placeholders. Um, it, it's, it's quite a big file, so... Uh, you can't see the artwork in, in all its glory, but uh, it's a single artist again that's worked uh, throughout this. And so we're getting ready for, uh, for Fiora Cheetah to, to come out uh, in a, a couple of months time. Okay, back to me. Um, right, we're kind of around the uh, the halfway mark. So I thought for the for the second half, we'd answer some of the questions that people have been posing 
busily you know, since I announced, hey, ask us some questions. My God, you didn't hold back, did you? Um, I, I did say on our Discord server, these were meant to be easy questions for us to answer. You, you know, you could have taken me at my word. That that would have been polite, I think, but you haven't. And you, you've actually posted some really, really good ones. So I, I circulated them in advance with the TDM team. So I think we're kind of prepared for, for what comes out. Um, and I think most of the people that have asked questions are, are here on the, the forum. So I can either read the questions out as they've been asked, or if people would like to ask them again verbally now, then maybe we'll give people that opportunity. So uh, we'll, we'll kick off with that. Who would like to ask us the first question? Or do I have to read it? I'll break the ice. I will read it, uh, mainly because the, there is something that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, so the question, I can't remember who it came from, but the question posed was, I've heard that the superhero adventure Agony and Ecstasy might become a proper full setting and rule book. Is that still a possibility? Um, who asked that question? Are they, are they on here? Ah, I've just noticed we've got some people and I haven't admitted. Oh my God. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, to those people that are just joining, I'm so sorry. I haven't realized that we had folk in the waiting room. I do apologize. I really am sorry. Fortunately, we are recording the uh, the seminar, so you won't miss out on anything. We will make sure that you, uh, you see the link. Uh, so, um, I'll just read out the question again. Um, I've heard that there's a superhero adventure, Agony and Ecstasy, and it might become a proper full setting and rule book. Is that still a possibility? Um, Mike and Brian, what, what do you reckon? No, that's that's completely false. There's yeah, no that's a dirty, rotten lie. Yeah. Um, no, uh, the, the working title Destined, uh, the superhero standalone book, is in editorial right now. Um, Mike and I put a lot of a uh, lot of time and hard work into it. Uh, made a lot of uh, changes, but Mike, anything you want to add to uh, you know just the, the kind of brief overview? Um, I I think it just kind of represents the growing of Mithras. Um, I think we've seen in products like After the Vampire Wars and Worlds United how versatile the system really is. Um, I know Brian and I both had the same thoughts prior to even kind of approaching laws about it, about the idea of using the system for superheroes. And you know, he was very receptive to it, and we're very grateful for that and the opportunity to work on this. So the short answer is yes. Uh, Destined is uh, it's completing editorial. Um, we're starting work on the art direction, and uh, yeah, that will be out at uh, some point next year. I think the key to it, what really sold me on it, was um, the approach that Mike developed for superpowers. Um, BRP systems have, uh, have tried superpowered games before. And I think Superworld's got a certain charm to it, but there's so some limitations to it. I mean, I certainly remember some of the limitations when we were playing it when I was at, at university a long time ago when it first came out. And I think what Mike did was find a way to represent superpowers in a way that scale very neatly to a certain level and add a continuing degree of interest rather than it just being you've got the fly ability or you've got the leap over buildings ability or you can pick up a tank with your little finger. He's found an incredibly neat way of building a core ability and the way that you can then customize those to, to make your hero completely unique. Uh, it's, it's a great approach. And that, that was what really, really sold me on, uh, on, on developing this. And you, you saw some of that in Agony and Ecstasy, and you'll see it again in Destiny when it comes out. Okay, so uh, the next question that we've got here is, uh, my, my friendly local game store doesn't carry the design mechanisms products. How can I get them to stock your game books? The easiest way to answer that is tell them to. Ask them to put in an order. Most game stores um, usually work with a distributor. Uh, the main distributor, um, it, certainly in the US and Canada, is called Alliance. And we do warehouse and distribute through Alliance. So if they don't have any of our books there, tell them to put an order. They can contact their Alliance rep. Their Alliance rep will put in an order with us and 
they will then stock it. But unless you tell your, your game store that you, you want to see our stuff there, um, Alliance won't just send it out to all the retailers. Retailers have to place orders. Um, we do let them know what we've got coming out. They know what, uh, what we're producing, but it does very much rely on customer demand. So if you want to see us stocked in your, your local game store, tell your game store to get in touch with their, their agents, um, their buyer and uh, and stock what we've got. Um, if they don't distribute through Alliance, they can come to us directly. And whether they're in the UK, in Europe, um, in Canada or the States, we can find a way for them to get some stock to us. And, you know, there's obviously going to be a discount for them so that they can make some money. Um, and there is always a way, but badger them, tell them. I think the other way that you can do things is offer to run games at the game store, you know, if they have the facilities to do it. Um, offer to run a game one evening or on Saturday, something like that. I, I did that for a number of years at uh, a, a booking game shop here in my hometown. And uh, um, Eric, uh, who's who's here on the panel, I got to know Eric through uh, through running games at Dan's, uh, Dan's Books and Games. And um, it's one of the best ways of introducing people to what we do and how we do it. So that's the advice I would give there. Uh, a sort of a rulesy question now, and I might get Pete to sort of chime in a little bit on this one. Um, high passions drive literary and mythic characters, not rational minimaxing. How can we get more out of passions as players and GMs? So I've got my thoughts on this. Uh, Pete, have you got any thoughts? Hmm. It's a difficult one because it, it depends on GMing style to a certain degree and how often passions are used. Um, if your GM doesn't really use passions very often, perhaps you can suggest as a player, can I use my passion to help me do this or as a substitute for making a willpower check there? Um, all I, I, my best experience of a very heavily passion driven campaign would be Loz's own hand campaign that he ran. Every year we have a, a, a gaming convention at my place up in the far, far north of Sweden. And we basically sit isolated by snow and ice for a week, solidly gaming and, and drinking. And, drinking. and <clears throat> He ran his Mythic Britain campaign on us as sort of as guinea pigs. And so we started off with a handful of passions, at, you know, mediocre 30 to 40 percent starting rate. I think within the first couple of days, we had tripled the number of passions we had because almost every single piece of conflict we entered into, uh, Loz would say, well, how do you feel about that? And, you know, depending on what people answer, you know, saying, right, have a passion, blah. And so if you got into an argument with your liege lord, it's like, there you go, hate such and such or distrust such and such. And very soon, it wasn't really our combat skills or our battlefield command skills or even our sort of singing and dancing skills that were actually driving things it was actually our passions and the passions became one of the if not the key part of the campaign and we became so totally invested with them but that was because every time so Lars would just throw yet another passion at us and so we we became a, a horrific mess of conflicting passions which only drove things to greater excesses because you didn't know should I be you know distrust my liege lord here or you know loyalty to the the region here and it was always you know what do I do what do I do and it was making us really stretching us uh, in our in terms of role playing so I don't really have much in the way of advising how to <laughs> to drive a, a, a campaign except make them the, the center and focus of the campaign Loz? I, I think you're right and it, it depends very much on on gming style i love them and uh, the, the mythic britain camera was was probably the you know the, the epitome of me really ramping those up um i mean the in the campaign uh, uh, the whole thing went to war there literally was a war because a passion role was fumbled 
Um, and that resulted in someone blurting out something that they were desperately trying not to say. And that triggered a whole series of events that affected the campaign all the way through. My advice would be you know, that understand what you can do with them. That they're not meant to make you behave in a certain way. They're meant to challenge your behavior. They're meant to make you think about how you're role playing and uh, how your character views the world, how they view, how they, they relate with other characters and non-player characters as well. So uh, my advice is embrace them. Um, don't overuse them, you know, don't do what I did with with, uh, with with Pete in the Mythic Breeding campaign, which was sort of trying to play test and we really did get invested. That's not to everybody's style and uh, and like, but, but do try them out. And if you are going to use them, do make them central to the campaign. Quite often it's, it's very refreshing to play something through with passions rather than result to the combat rules. And uh, so I, I, they're, they're my favorite feature of Mithras and... Uh, I, I, I do use them a lot, and I always try and encourage other people to use them. So I hope that answers that. I, th I think, um, John, you asked that question, but I, I hope that, that helps in some way. And I think you saw some of that when you, you played in uh, my, my Leoness playtest game as well. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's just trying to get players to really embrace their passions. That's what I'm trying to get, get them to do, really. Okay, from the game master's perspective, have a good understanding and a good uh, memory of what your players' passions are. Maybe make a list of them behind the GM screen and every once in a while throw something at them uh, till it becomes, you know, habit. And maybe once, if you, and, and do it as a benefit in their favor. Say, okay? oh, you have such and such a passion. You, you can add one fifth of that to this next role because because of this so you know throw it out as a, a positive thing in their favor and then they will start to engage with it more when they see that's a horrible way of looking at players in some ways but you know they they like having advantages then of course Absolutely. five minutes later you use it as a hindrance against them Absolutely. thank you brilliant cheers okay so um Let's see what else have we got on here. I'd, I'd love to see some more guidance on adventure and maybe supplement pitch and writing, particularly with design mechanism and Mithras in mind. Do's and don'ts and basically what you feel the company, uh, we the company, feel that people are looking for. Um, we, we love seeing submissions. We love seeing submission ideas. Um, I think there are a number of things that we, we, we certainly look for. First of all, a very good pitch. Um, we, we, we get a lot of people with ideas that really don't go anywhere or ideas that, uh, that they've been done before. Um, and it's, there's nothing new in role playing, you know, all the best scenarios have been thought of, all the best scenario ideas have been done, but you can do things differently. So what I would encourage is that you, you, you think very carefully about um, what it is you want to approach us with and really work on the pitch. It needs to be compelling. It needs to be concise. So usually one side of, of A4 or one side of, of letter, about 500 words is enough. You need to be able to convey what the scenario is about, how you're approaching it differently, and demonstrate to us that you're going to be competent to handle this as a piece of work. Um, people think that writing scenarios or supplements or campaign books is, is easy because it's something that we all love doing. We love playing role-playing games. You know, we love reading them. My God, it's hard. It, it really is. The number of people that come to us and we contract to do something that actually don't complete it is relatively high. Uh, the fallout rate is, and, and even with some professional writers that have been doing this a long time, they realize that they can't meet the deadlines, they can't make their, their original concept work. So it really is a challenging piece of writing. You do need to be sure that you can do it. So try out personally yourself. Write up some adventures for yourself as if you were writing them for publication. Look at things that we've published. Study how they're put together. Think about the way language is being used. Um, one of the things that um, we try and editorially remove from a lot of our, our things are is the passive voice, which is the characters will see this, the NPCs will do that. We try and eliminate that. It should be active all the time. So the characters see the monster, the NPCs do whatever it is they're going to do. So look at the styles that we use and the way that scenarios are structured. And if you, you want to submit something to us, send us a pitch, send us 500 words, really think about 
what you want to convey, how you want to convey and and what it's going to do. What is it going to tell? What's the story like? What's the engagement for the characters and what's the engagement for the non-player characters? Um, it, it's a tough call. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have a go, but it does mean that you need to be um, aware of, of what you are in for. Now, if we like a pitch, we will probably ask you to develop it a little bit more. So we'll ask you to send us a sample chapter um, or maybe expand on the outline so that we get a better idea of, of what sort of size uh, this piece of work is. Is it going to be a 16 or a 32 page scenario? That makes a lot of difference in the work we have to put into it. Um, is it going to be a campaign book? You know, are, are you recommending a very large piece of work that could take a couple of years to come to fruition? So you have to understand how long it can take for these things to develop. Um, you need to be patient as well. Um, although you might be able to write a scenario in a couple of months, don't expect us to be able to work at that pace. We've got a lot of things that we're currently working on. It can take anything up to two or even three years for a book to, uh, to, to come through the pipeline. Mythic Babylon, uh, Chris Gilmore has been working on that since 2012. And that gives you a good idea of how long it can take to develop a really detailed source book. We've been editing it and working on the art direction for pretty close to a year now. And we're only just beginning to sort of get it into the, the final production stage. So it is a long haul. Um, a book like Leoness took us two years to write, and that was all experienced writers that were doing it. Um, so understand that there is a, that there are certain pressures and expectations on you as a writer, certain things we are looking for. And we don't mean to be personal if we kind of take your work apart and suggest criticisms. It's because we've done this so many times before. We know what works. We know what works for us. We, we know what we need within the company structure and, and the way that we develop our, our Mithras products. So listen to us and work with us. If we ask for corrections or changes, don't take that personally. It, it's for the good of the product and it will help you develop as a writer. Um, I don't, Brian, Carol, did anything that you'd add to any of that? You see just as much of all of this as I do. Uh, I'm happy to say a couple of words about that. Yeah, it's with that pitch, if you're excited about it, we're more likely to be excited about it. So focus on that excitement. You know, don't just try to come up with an idea to have an idea. Um, that That's a trap. <laughs> you know, you don't just want to do something that's going to please a whole bunch of people because you think it'll fit into a market. No, come up with something that really excites you because we can work it out from there. But if there's no core of excitement, there's no really good idea. Um, also that working with people, we're here to try to bring out your idea in the best possible way. So it's a yes and situation. You know, we're always trying to add to it. We're not taking away from it, even if the criticisms seem harsh or very different. It's a give and take. At least that's how I look at it when I talk to people. You know, you always have a voice, but we have the experience to say, well, sometimes we're going to need to tweak it a little. You know, we, we know a bit more about that big picture and that's what we're trying to share with you. So, so just bear that in mind, you know, we're here to help. Absolutely. It's, we're it's not too scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, not too, well, Brian is sometimes, but he tells me off. So, you know, I, I have to work with him. And Carol oh, tells me off as well. You know, you, you, you've been a dick loss, stop doing that. No, okay. No, I don't have anything. I think, I think Carol hit the nail on the head. It, 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 uh, yeah, if you're passionate about what it is you're writing about, then it's going to come through in the writing and that makes our lives a lot easier as well. So. But do, do contribute things, you know, we, what, the things that we want to see, some of the things I want to see are things that support our existing product lines. Love to see some Luther Arkwright coming through. Scenarios for after the vampire wars, Worlds United, um, Mythic Britain, um, any of our mythics range, anything that, that supports, even if it's only a 16 page adventure, um, a write-up of something that you've played, if you've got that passion for it and you really want to try your hand a bit, we're here to help and sort of encourage you. Those are the things that we really, I, I certainly really want to see. That will catch my attention. Um, a lot more than sort of a generic fantasy thing uh, of the kind that we, we occasionally put out. I'm really gonna be interested in seeing our line supported. And you know, that goes too for Destined and um, some of the other things that we've got coming up. 
Okay, so uh, one more question uh, from this list. I'm going to open it up to the floor if anybody else has any questions about what we've been talking about or specific questions for, for members of the panel here. Um, can you talk a bit more about the process with regards to the Mithras Gateway licensing versus having it, versus having it published by TDM? So the Mithras Gateway license is uh, the ability for you as an independent creator to put something together using the Mithras brand, using the Mithras rules, whether it's Mithras imperative, our free rule set in their entirety, or using bits and pieces from the core rules that you self-publish. Um, you can sell it, you can make money from it, you don't pay us anything, there's no royalty. What we do ask is that you, you get some approval for us. So you share with us the idea, just in case it's gonna conflict with something that we are working on. The last thing we wanna do is say yes to someone's superhero supplement that they want to publish under the gateway when we're actually gonna be publishing one next year that may well eclipse theirs. We don't wanna do that. We want to make sure that it's um, your, your, your fire is not gonna be stolen by what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> second, what we want to do with the approval process is make sure the work actually does come up to standard and make sure it uses the rules in the right way. As I've said before, it's not easy to write role-playing game material. It may look it, but it really isn't. And the approval process actually lets us give you some help and guidance on things that you can use, things that you can't use, and some tips on, um, on, on what you can do with the material. And there are about four or five gateway products that are due to come out over the next few months where we've done exactly that. We've worked with the authors, just give them some gentle um, tips and hints on how to make it a better product. Uh, make sure we can see how the rules are being used. Um, two products that spring to mind, one was released today and it's called Red Daggers. And um, this is a classic uh, classic fantasy scenario where, where Rodney worked very closely with the author to make sure it, it hit all the right marks and is gonna be the best product that they can release. Um, the other one is, uh, I forget the name of the title, but it's a, a zombie apocalypse horror survival game. Uh, based heavily on uh, Mithras Imperative, which is certainly a topic we wouldn't tackle as a publisher. Um, but uh, Heath Delishmit, that's written it, has, has done a great job of, uh, you know, you, you want to play The Walking Dead? There's the, the Mithras version of The Walking Dead, or Mad Max versus The Walking Dead, or however you, you want to phrase it. It's a beautiful little game. And I think kind of the epitome of it for, for us was... was um, uh, Clarence read M Space and Odd Soot. You know, Clarence had a very clear vision of what he wanted to do with a science fiction BRP game. He took Mithras Imperative and he molded it in the right ways, bouncing ideas off uh, off myself and Pete for how he could put that into into practice. And uh, he's done a fantastic job. And it's been incredibly well received. You know, M Space is its own thing now. It's fully standalone, and I'm really proud to be associated with it. And equally so with Odd Soot, which is another science fiction tale that Clarence came up with completely weird concept you know it's kind of Edwardian Cthulhu mixed with um, a sort of a uh, an, an almost steampunk ethos and, it, and it's not even really kind of that it's very difficult to describe wholly original looks fantastic and it's got a, a steadily growing following um, so the Mithras gateway license is here to sort of facilitate what you want to do as a fledgling independent publisher. We ask to look over the idea just so that it, we can help with it and we don't contradict it and make sure certain standards are met. You know, we, do, we don't want people putting in there anything that could be potentially harmful or contentious or infringe on someone else's IP, which is actually very easy to do quite inadvertently. So it's there to act as kind of a safety net. Um, how does that differ from publishing with design mechanism? Well, if you publish it under the, the gateway license, you take all the glory. You, you keep all the royalties, all the payments. You can make your name for yourself, just like Clarence has done with M Space. You can, you can sort of forge your own section of the market. Um, if you work with us, then we are buying the rights from you. And what we're doing is working very closely with you, which we don't necessarily do with the gateway side of things, through the editorial stage, the art direction stage, uh, to make sure that the best product that we can produce as a company is coming out. And, um, um, you know, it's because it's something we're buying from you. It's it's very sort of gig based. It's 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 a work for hire contract, but we will pay you for it. Uh, so you may not see as much as you might see if you self publish. 
Alternatively, if what you self-published doesn't sell very well, you may see more. And of course, if we like what you've written, there'll be more work for you and we'll invite you to work on other projects. That's how Mark Shirley works with us, Alex Green. Um, the writers like, uh, um, like Darwin Martin on the classic fantasy side, people that are beginning to work, uh, and Mike Larrymore as well. You know, they've all come to us with ideas that we've published and there's more work coming through for them. So those are the, the, the key differences between working directly with TDM and publishing and uh, using the gateway. It depends on what you want to do and get out of it. Um, okay, that we've actually got through most of those questions. We've, we're have we actually on the eight o'clock hour, which is uh, where we, we should uh, call a halt. Um, if people do need to, to drop off, then uh, obviously please do. And I, I would say thank you very, very much for coming along to the seminar, for supporting us, for all the kind words that we frequently get. And uh, your, your continued, uh, it, it means a hell of a lot to all of us. It really does. We wouldn't do this if it wasn't for the opportunity to work with people like you and, um, and and have these kinds of conversations. We do it because we love what we're doing and we've got a great supportive fan base. We want to keep that growing and and, uh, and sort of keep you with us on this journey. Um, but if people uh, want to sort of stay and hang out, I'm more than happy to go and grab another beer, turn the recording off. And if people want to hang and chat and... Uh, and, and shoot the breeze with, with me and anybody else that wants to stay on, I'm more than happy to do that. So officially, I'm going to say thank you very, very much on behalf of Brian, of Carol, of Pete, of Mike, of Ian, of Soph, of Rod. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you. Have a great GenCon, have a great weekend, and stay healthy and safe, please.